Welcome to the Learning Without Limits interview series. I'm your host, Melanie Bernicle. This episode, I chat to Ben Carrington, who is a sales specialist. We're going to dig deep and get all of his insider information on sales strategy, how do you create a great lead, what is a great lead, how to get the most out of your sales strategy, how to create a sales strategy, and what's really important. And does it really need to be difficult? He's going to give us all the insider info, so stay tuned. This exciting episode is going to help you and your business or your sales team reach your goals. Check it out. Ben, thanks so much for joining me. Oh, pleasure, Mel. Awesome. Can you take me through sort of the beginning of your career and what led you to become a sales specialist? Right, so being called a specialist is a funny one, but uh, I guess I have been doing this for some time now, so I do appreciate yeah. that. You might, we always underplay it a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, uh, no, I actually, it was funny. What led me to that was I had a few friends working for a phone sales company. Yep. Um, and that was just after school, so like around that 18, 19 new period. Um, a bit unsure what I was going to do in my career. Yep. And I went in um, for an interview and got the job and then joined, joined the business. Yeah. And I just fell in love with that. Uh, so it was it was essentially selling Telstra phone uh, plans for yes. Telstra. So yep. it was a company that was contracted by Telstra. Mm -hmm. So you may have had a call from me. I'm not sure. We used to, <laughs> we, we used to call thousands and thousands of people yeah. um, and convert them over from like Vodafone or Optus and try and get them across to Telstra. Yeah. And yeah, there was a lot of things about it that I liked. The thrill of the sale, obviously. Yes. Talking to lots of different people and hearing their stories and understanding what what you know what it is out of even something like a simpler phone plan means to them you know you yeah. talk to people in rural you know New South Wales that couldn't um, speak to loved ones or you speak to, so it's just amazing all the different types of conversations that you'd have yeah um, and from there my passion really progressed from into phone sales amazing so you were working more like a say like a call center type field rather than in store exactly so yeah. all phone yeah so um Phone sales on the phone. So okay. we're selling phones through the phone. So yeah. um, it all basically the way it worked is an automatic dialer. Yes. So you'd have your headset on. Yep. The calls drop um, drop in when someone answers and yep. then you'd start the, the script. Wow. How mm. do you find, you know, working when you, you don't see someone face-to-face? -face? Like mm. I always find I'm better in person, I mm -hmm. think, than mm -hmm. on the phone mm -hmm. with certain things. So when you don't have that connection, a visual connection with someone, mm. Like, obviously, you have to have, there's something obviously in the tone. You're like, you speak quite, mm. you know, nicely as well. So do you think the tone mm. in the voice and so many things come to play to get people to feel confident with you quite you, quickly? With yeah, that so there's a lot of, um, and I think that's another reason why I like phone sales is because you don't have the um, opportunity to see the person and you, you kind of have to find a common ground without you know, your surroundings and mm. physically seeing them. So what you typically do is try and through questions at the start identify a problem that the person has. Yes. And then you can connect with them through that problem. So So kind of like any sales pitch, even if you're doing like a deck and sending it out from Canva. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. So it's that same identifying the problem for that individual. Mm. But without seeing them, because sometimes you know, if you know someone's looking for something specific, but without mm. doing that, that's a real skill to maybe ask the right questions. Definitely. And that's questions is actually, so people think about sales as almost like the, you know, like the that typical phone salesman cliche. It's like, hi, how are you going? Yes. But in actual reality, the best sales are those who can ask the most questions at the start and identify the needs. Yeah. So that was a big process that we did. We had a list of like identifying questions. Yep. And then when we get into like the pitch, yes. it's all tailored around what they've told us at the start. What, what I always found fascinating too is there was sales people in that business, like there was one guy in particular who was by far the best. Yeah. Right? Absolutely freak right? he almost could convert anyone and wow. we always wanted to know like what is it about this guy Jack's his name was yes that made him so much better than everyone else yeah and we put it down to things like when he spoke he was very indifferent so the typical hi how are you going that's almost a, a, a thing for people to think oh salesperson exactly so he would speak very smoothly calmly like he mm. didn't really mind if he wanted to switch or not which yep. gave people a lot of confidence to actually listen to what he was saying. Yeah. And then he was really good at connecting with people, so asking questions, finding common ground and then tailoring it back to that person. Do so. you think someone like this particular guy was genu genuinely curious about mm. people and also wanting to get to the why? 
behind? I, I think so, yeah. I think he was very well, he was very understanding about the product that he was selling and yep. therefore very good at identifying who it was suited to and why. Mm. And I think through that, yeah, he was able to, yeah, like his his numbers were so significant. It was almost we'd just watch him in awe. Yeah. Um, but that's really what I put it down to, which was quite fascinating to see. When you look at other businesses, what do you think are some common mistakes, say, in small to medium businesses that mm. people just don't get right with sales? Mm. So it's a tough one to answer because there are so many varying businesses yeah. and sales. There are there are some businesses that a direct selling method is 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 just perfect for, and there's other businesses that requires a different type of strategy. Mm. So I think a big mistake that people make is maybe not having the correct understanding about which strategy they should be taking because. Yep. Phone sales, for example, doesn't work in other industries, whereas mm. digital marketing may not work for others. So yep. I think understanding what your strategy should be and really where that comes from is who your customer is. What yep. um, channels are they either yep. on or how do you get to your customer? Yes. And then what do you need to put in front of them to convert them? Okay. A lot of people don't even have a sales strategy in place. Mm. They rely on their existing customer base. Mm. Like what advice could you give to someone if they were starting out in creating a sales strategy apart from just, okay, here's your core, mm -hmm. you know, core consumer, like where would you go next? Mm -hmm. So I think like previously uh, the other question as well, it does come down to who your customer is. Yes. So start with who is who is my customer? Yes. And essentially all lead generation sales is is getting your message in front of the right people. So right. you don't need to overcomplicate sales and strategies and because it does sound quite hard. It does. But who's who's my who's my customer? Yep. For example, if I'm a dog walker in a certain area. Yes. My customer are dog owners in this area. So yes. how do I get in front of dog owners in my area? Mm -hmm. And what message do the, are they going to want to see? So is it, you know, are you? I'm I'm guessing with dog walker, even you could drill down further to being someone who's busy who owns a dog. So yes. is it? Do you want to save time walking your dog? And then how do you get in front of them? So it's really about breaking it down quite simply to start. Yes. Um, and then once you start to build a bit of momentum and through that, it's then about identifying further ways to then scale what you are doing. Yeah, I think that's great. So identifying the core consumer and then identifying their personal needs mm. and being able to, to deliver what they're looking for. Exactly, and just getting the message in front of them. So we're very lucky these days yeah. with all the different ways we can do that now. We've got yes. Google, we've got Facebook, mm -hmm. we've got Instagram, we've now got TikTok. Yep. We've got all the traditional methods of letter drops and word of mouth and everything. So we are spoiled for choice, yes. uh, which is obviously good, but does then also bring a bit of complexity to which method is, um, is best. Mm. But I always ask yourself, where to pe uh, tell people to think about where did you hear about your competitors? Ah. So where are they marketing that made you, what, why are your competitors more known than you? Yep. And where are those customers seeing them? You yes. know, and that's a good place to start as well. That's really great advice. From a, I guess from a br like brandy and marketing have to have to correlate. So yes. your, your company's messaging and tone of voice and everything has to be equal across all the comms that you put out no matter yes. what strategy it is. So that way your brand is correctly reflected. Yep. Um, and then you just need to work out from there what is your goal? So is your goal to generate a lot more new customers? Is your goal to re-engage existing customers? Or is your goal to just get brand awareness? And then you need to then target your or deliver your strategy based on that goal. So within your sales strategy, you mm. might have three goals. Mm. One, drive sales. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Two, mm. you know, hit your existing customers up for further sales in different areas. Yeah. And then so it's not just one particular way. So you, no. you can start to you think, okay, sales strategy, break it down. Mm -hmm. And you might have three, three things that you want to hit in your sales strategy strategy. Three things that you might want to hit in the mm. sales strategy mm. over the next six months. Yeah. Now, right. for a business, how would you measure mm. a sales? How do you know what's working and what's not? Yeah, so I think this is the key. And once again, we are very lucky with all the, the um, channels that we do have now because they're very data-driven. Mm. And I think uh, measuring against KPIs is probably the main um, key performance indicators, yes. that's probably the most important thing for a, a good marketing strategy. Yes. So for a small business that doesn't have a huge budget, naturally yep. you'd like your customer acquisition to be profitable. 
Mm. Therefore, for every customer that you bring on through your different channels, yes. you need to be able to work out what cost that customer had to acquire. So You've read my mind. So I was thinking <laughs> that. So how do they work out what type of dollar value you'd spend mm. per customer? Is it based on the product that you're delivering? Mm -hmm. So say, for example, we had a course that was $1,000 mm. and it cost you $50 per person you know, in acquiring that new customer. Mm -hmm. You know, is there a percentage that you'd think, okay, if, you know, I'm spending this much money, mm -hmm. uh, that's, oh, sorry, if I'm bringing in that much money through what I'm selling, yeah. you know, and if it's dog walking and it might be, what, $40 an hour, mm -hmm. something like that. So obviously you don't want your spend to be $50. Mm -hmm. So is that how you do work it out on a percentage based on the sales product? That's exactly right. So okay. a naturally $1,000 product, for example, yep. A mattress is yes. going to have a much higher customer acquisition cost yep. than finding a um, new dog walking customer mm. because the lifetime value of that customer, although in the dog walking scenario, the lifetime value might be extremely high mm. um, because they might stay with you for a number of years. So, um, yep. so you need to then work out at what is a feasible amount for me to be able to spend on acquiring new customer. Yes. And then... But it's not as simple as if a, if a mattress is a thousand and I spend three hundred, then that's good. Because what about if they then buy pillows from you, doing covers mm. from you? So that you you might have to work out what's my value. Does a customer buy one product and that's it for me, yes. or is their lifetime value quite high in that I'm prepared to spend a little bit more up front to get them, yes. and then make money as I go? Yep. So it's about what's the sales journey look like exactly. potentially and that then comes back to something else you'd add into the strategy, the strategy mm. for what you're selling. Mm -hmm. See, I think this is all really, for me, like I love talking <laughs> this stuff and I find it fascinating and you're the expert and, but it just really reiterates mm. the importance of, you know, getting a customer mm. and keeping them. Oh, definitely. Do that, you find it. customer acquisition, mm -hmm. um, like if you could keep an existing client, mm -hmm and nurture them through that, is, is obviously it's a lot more cost effective mm. long term. Mm. Definitely. And I think this is maybe sometimes, you know, it's particularly in bigger businesses, maybe an overlooked strategy mm. and that nurturing your existing customer base is, is key. And I think sometimes people get focused way too much on new sales and new customers, which is important and you do need them. Yeah. But you can't be at the neglect of your existing customer base. Yeah. I, I was trying to explain that to like a couple of creators that I work with, you know, where's your database? Mm. Oh, I, don't, I don't have one. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, actually every job you've been on as a freelancer, there's probably three to five people on a call sheet mm. that could potentially be someone that you could work with again. And sometimes uh, say a photographer might book you mm. or, you know, a director might book you. Mm. So you've got a database and obviously you'd want to speak to them differently. Mm. The way I'd talk to a producer would be very different to another makeup artist saying, hey, baby, if you need a hand, <laughs> yeah. but I'm not going to turn around to a producer and go, hey, babe, like because mm -hmm. they'd be like, um, weird like you know <laughs> yeah, so yeah. you want to speak to them differently mm. but you've already got these people and you've worked for them they trust you exactly. they they already have that rapport with you mm. so getting a new customer who doesn't know you to try and book you or do mm. something is a lot harder than working with the ones that you already have definitely the yeah, and again, low like, hanging fruit, they call that. So, low yeah, hanging fruit. Yeah, oh, I yeah, like so the sound of that. They're, they're the easiest ones to get from the tree because, exactly like, they already trust your brand. Yep. They already have a relationship with you. And yes. therefore, if you've got new products or services, they're probably your first market that you should be thinking about. Yeah. So, again, so that's where do you go in your strategy? Mm. Okay, great. These are all the people that I've worked with before. Mm. Let's hit them up first. We've got a new product to deliver and they already know and they trust us. Mm. So, you know, if they're in the market for that, they're going to come on board. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. And your customer acquisition cost in that scenario would be n nil. Yeah. That, you know, thereabouts, depending on how you contact them through EDM or yep. even if it's through a personal phone call, whatever yes. it may be. Uh, you haven't had to pay to uh, to get that extra sale. Mm. So then the profit per item mm. goes up for those. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> get those dollars in the door. Um, people do fall into this trap of working in their business and not necessarily on their business. Mm. And there are there are businesses where they are the main purpose and, you know, single operators and they are the most important thing. But for people that want to have a small business whereby it's not reliant on them, yeah. um, I think they need to consider what roles others could do that they that 
can do them better than them mm. and then how can they step out so that they can focus on things like growing the business and making the customer experience better, which is what's going to build them um, that sustainable long-term business growth that they're looking for. Yeah. talked about, you know, nurturing the existing customer. Now, if I'm looking at lead generation, mm -hmm. so new customers, mm -hmm. so that's what we classified as, as lead generation. So yep. you're, you're looking for the new customer. Mm -hmm. Can you take me through the lead generation process? Yeah. Yeah, so lead generation, once again, it's really about identifying your customer yep. and then thinking, how do I get my message that I want to betray, whether it be the benefits of our business or product or service, whether it be a sale that we have or some sort of giveaway or well, whatever the message is, yep. how do I get that in front of the right people? Mm -hmm. And then the, what is great about the, the new world that we're in now, when I previously worked in phone sales, it was basically calling the phone book where yeah. you had very little information on people. Yep. And in reality, that just creates a lot of work. You will get there in the end, but mm. now you can cut through a lot of that with social media and with yeah. different other lead generation um, strategies. You can get really, um, you know, basically like unique lead gen. I'll oh, say. Yeah, that that's way. right. Um, you can basically through all this digital marketing now, you can get a lead that's very highly qualified. So yes. you, you could have, a, you're, you're cutting out 90% of the calls that we used to make and you're only speaking to or digitally speaking to through email or whatever it might be, yep. people that are actually relevant to what you're offering. Wow. Mm. I think, I guess that makes it more cost effective mm. in that sense that you, you really are hitting people within like a, you know, that yeah. kind of bullseye. So I think when it's funny, it is more cost effective, but what's happened is the cost has now gone into the lead as opposed to into the um, workforce doing the calls. So before you'd have to have a large team of salespeople making calls yes, and you'd have to have um, cheap leads where now yes. leads are expensive because they are highly qualified, right. but it means a lot less um, people needed to be called or contacted because, yes. because you're, you know, you're, the digital marketing is doing that for you. It's yes. getting the right people. Right. So you find now that the teams themselves may be smaller. Definitely. Okay. So yeah. if you're looking at a call centre, there'd be less people dialing out because the leads are highly quite. Is that what you classify as a good lead as well? Good lead, yeah. So, I mean, you probably now real. I mean, yourself, you probably get less cold calls. Like I think the days of... I can't take my business off the thing. I get calls. I oh. probably, I reckon I get six a day. Oh, right. Oh, there you go. Yeah. But you probably never buy anything. No. No. I hang up before they say two words. Exactly. I hear the crackling. I'm like... Sorry. So Ben, when we're talking lead generation, mm -hmm. so a highly qualified lead is your terminology yeah. and that's what's classified as a good lead. Mm -hmm. That's right. So... One channel that we're all very familiar with that's very good at generating leads is Facebook. Mm. Um, so you may have been targeted previously with an ad, uh, whether it be like a common is like real estate, property, do it a lot, yep. um, phone services, electrician, uh, sorry, like a you know energy retailer. They send beauty products my way. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then what you'll do, they have what's called a lead capture form. So Facebook yep. Leads runs this program now where you basically – it auto fills your first name, last name, email. Yes. Yeah. And yes. then it will then ask you maybe one or two qualifying questions. So, ah. you know, have you, like, for example, in a real estate, do you own your own home or mm -hmm. are you looking to for investment or to um, to live in? So that is then what I would call a highly qualified lead. Yes. Because that's someone who has made contact with the business, shown yes. interest, answered some questions to identify that they are the right person yep. and then they're expecting your phone call. How does, what's the difference and how does it all tie in together between online and offline? So um, it's interesting because some businesses can be purely online. Yep. Um, so in fact, we have, a, we have a business now that is a meal kit company. So yep. we deliver um, ingredients um, just like similar to like a HelloFresh or Marley Spoon, which Great. a lot of people know. So that customer acquisition journey is 100% online. So that was new to me. Yes. Um, so we generate, whether it be social media ads or, or EDMs, different marketing, and the customer will go through and they'll buy direct from the site without yep. any contact from us. So that is what... A lot of businesses in e-commerce are moving towards yes. 100% online. Yes. Um, but then there is a blend of generating a lead through online um, methods, whether yes. it be Google, Facebook, customer surveys, lots of number of yep. ways of doing that, and then bringing that human touch through a phone call, face-to-face um, -face meetings, different things like that. So. Can I – when it, I was just, it just got me thinking then. So obviously a, a meal delivery kit mm. – would be, you know, probably what under a hundred bucks. 
Yeah, know. so between, yeah, our average spend is $110. Okay, yeah. great. So if that's mm. about $110, mm. everything's online. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously with fashion online, if it was e-commerce, you know you can send it back if it doesn't fit, so you don't yeah. need that personal contact. But then when the product becomes bigger mm. and more expensive, is yeah. that when you think that the the personal touch needs to come in? Because if people are going to invest in a, mm. a product that's worth a little bit more money, mm. maybe not electronics like a fridge or something, I think mm. people could feel confident buying that. But mm -hmm. if it was a course or something mm. sometimes, like when they're looking at, you know, a $5,000 workshop or something, mm -hmm. is that when you think they should pick up the phone? Yeah, it's, it's funny that you mentioned courses because I think that's a great example. Yep. Um, that was obviously a previous business that I had in education um, yes. marketing. And like quite like large exactly, courses, because, not your you know, short courses or things, but yeah. You know. And even even short courses that are that are above I'd say like a three month and three month plus course. Mm -hmm. it, Online people, I mean, you will have some that know exactly what they want and, yep. and they'll go through an um, enrol. Yes. But I think a course is a, a decision that you sometimes you need to identify with someone on the phone. Mm. Is it the right course for you and answer any kind of questions? Again, identifying their need, which is the core exactly. <laughs> basis it, of sales. Yeah, <laughs> exactly right. Because you may, you know, as much information as you can give online, sometimes when you actually get that personal touch, as you know yourself in many different ways, you, that you can pick up other things that, oh, actually, I read it like that, but maybe it's not for me because yeah. of X, Y, Z, and then they can maybe recommend something that is for you. So I think that touch is very important for more um, conscious um, decisions that you need to make. You know. Yeah. When it comes to sort of a CRM, which is your client relationship manager, mm -hmm. um, this is where people can market from, add their database, keep their database in check and refer back to clients. Mm -hmm. Have you got any tips on the best way to utilise the information captured in like a CRM? Yeah, so I think some of the best businesses today know the value of data mm. and data is one of those words that can seem quite daunting to someone. Yep. But in actual fact, really all data is are just the things that you actually know but it's the way that we house them and the way that you use them. So. Yes. All, as much information as you can get about your current customers, mm -hmm. if you can extract that information, you then know which customers to target because there'll be similarities in demographics like mm. age, location, mm -hmm. um, and any other information that you may have. Mm. So I think make sure when building a CRM, you have data points that are important and also ones that don't have ones that aren't important because you don't want to be asking your customers questions that are irrelevant because... People, as you may know, they are private mm. and they only have time to give so much information. So don't overload them. Yep. Pick the data points that you need. Like yes. so a good one may be age, location, yep. um, number of orders, these types of data points, and then um, ensure to have it clean, which is, which is hard. So updating emails, contact yes. details, um, and then using that information to base a lot of your future decisions. Yeah, and a good CRM just for people who aren't familiar with it, mm. you can go through that data and then email accordingly mm. and use that data capture. So if I just wanted to say, right, we're in Sydney, we're doing a show, mm. and you just well, you don't want to send that information to the people in Melbourne because they're like, well, this isn't relevant, so mm. they may not look at your next email. Mm. But for the people that are in Sydney, then you can direct target them mm. and then that information goes to, you, to them. Yeah, and that's exactly right. So a good data point, like you just mentioned, is geographical location yep. so there's no point as you mentioned telling some someone about an event in Sydney when they're in Melbourne all yep. you're going to do in that case is upset your data and that's the last thing you want to do so I think yes. you're, you're exactly right on, on all that yeah I think or just when you're ident mm. well, going back to you know that key point of identifying your customer needs mm. if they're not going to need that don't send it to them mm. because for me if I'm just being bombarded with stuff over and over and mm. over and you're just thinking you don't actually care about me. Mm. I'm just a number <laughs> on your database. Mm -hmm. And then that's not how you want them to feel if you're trying to nurture somebody. Mm. No, definitely. Yeah. I, mean, I think we all know those businesses where we've had interactions yeah. and then the emails start coming and they start coming quickly. Thick and fast. Yeah, and that's when you you know, you know hit unsubscribe and you, and you just do, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I have a moment. It's almost like deleting one of those online dating apps. You know, you have your moment, you're like, delete, 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 delete. And yeah. I literally go through and unsubscribe, unsubscribe, unsubscribe. Mm. And it's just days where you're already feeling overwhelmed. You've got so much going yeah. on. You're like, I can't deal. I don't want to see this email again. Mm. Mm. 
mm. and you just you're out. Yeah. So they've lost your business because they're just mm. in your face too much, and it's stuff that's not relevant. Mm. And so I've always said with email marketing because for us it has been such an effective tool, mm. but less is more. So yeah. don't bombard and only hit. Um, you know, messages that you think are relevant at that time to that person and yes. you shouldn't have much of an issue in that case. Great. Good information. <laughs> well, can you just go and tell all these other businesses that keep sending me emails these <laughs> things? <laughs> you got more chance of keeping me if you're not in my face. <laughs> Sounds like dating as well. <laughs> when it comes to building out a sales team, mm -hmm. do you find that people will now use an external company mm -hmm. or will they build it out inside? What's the mm -hmm. best way to do it? Or what are a couple of different ways to do it? Maybe not the best, but obviously it's different for mm. different businesses. But what are some ways that, that you can build out your sales team and quite quickly? Yeah. Well, I think if you can build it internally, yep. um, it is probably best, particularly if you're a smaller business uh, with a smaller budget yep. and you want to have a bit more control. Yes. Because sales is a process that you're not necessarily going to get right straight away and it does need a lot of work and understanding and tweaking to get it right. Yep. So if you have control of that process, it will allow you a lot more flexibility to get the right process down pat and then at that point, then you can start to scale. So I think that's an important message there as well. It doesn't mean you're getting, you're not going to get it right first time. So this is something that does need to be tweaked. So mm. I think when sometimes people in business think that they failed at something, it's mm. not the desired result, then they, it might hold them and stop them. Mm. So just know that with sales, okay, it's going to need tweaking mm, and you have to be aware of this. Mm. I think that's a really key point that you might have. I'm just going to reiterate it because sometimes people let that stuff stop them. Mm. It's about tweaking it and making it right. It's not about what you've done wrong. It's about, okay, what can I do better? In a, if you're looking to employ someone mm -hmm. in the sales in the sales team, mm. what do you look for in somebody? Well, that's a, that's a, once again that's a that's a difficult thing because a salesperson isn't necessarily there is no right or wrong answer. Mm. Um, you can have all types of people can be amazing salespeople in the right field. But yeah. something that I would look for, particularly if you're a small business, is someone who's passionate about what you're doing. Um, because the best, you know, the best sales come from those that really mean it yep. and believe what they're selling because customers are smart mm -hmm. um, and they can understand, does this person genuinely believe what they're telling me yep. um, or is this person just trying to sell me anything? Yep. So start with someone who's very passionate about your business, product or service, mm. uh, and then you can really build from there. When you're building out your sales team, mm. how do you manage to keep the integrity of the brand when you've got so many different people working for mm -hmm. you? Is that through education or is it through team building? Like what's the best way? Because I know that you've had mm. businesses where you've built out teams, mm. you know, quite big. Mm. And how did you manage to keep the integrity of the brand whilst you've got so many people trying to deliver a message and in their own personal ways probably? Mm. Yeah, so no, it's a good question. So for us, um, we, did, we had built quite a large team um, and I put that down to a few things. One that you mentioned just then is training. Yep. So anyone that works for your business representing your brand needs to understand more than just a script. Yep. They need to understand the principles of the company. They need to understand the history of the company. They need to understand how you speak, how you don't speak, who has done it successfully and what they sound like. So there's a huge amount of training that's beyond just, a, I think a lot of people think, here's the script, go, and they start. But you need yeah. to know what you're selling and that doesn't mean just the product or service, it's who you're representing. Yeah. And I think if you can get the training part right, mm. then not only are they better salespeople, but they actually like their job more because they got, they understand it in depth. Yes. Um, because a lot of, and and taking that time at the start. So when we had the um, previous business, it was a mi mi minimum five day training wow. before you started. So you do five days of hard training yep. and then we do refreshes every fortnight. Wow. So, yeah. So I think that's a very important part. Well, I guess it, it feels like they're not left up to their own devices. You're constantly, mm. again, not just nurturing yeah. you know, the salesperson that yeah. you're, sorry, you're not just nurturing the consumer that yeah. you're wanting to buy, you're nurturing your team. So if they feel nurtured, they're going to be able to nurture the consumer. Like mm. it just makes sense that that nurturing comes from above and that education. And then when people feel part of something, they mm. talk like they're a part of something, not like they're talking for something. Definitely. Wow. Yeah, I think I just didn't realise like every fortnight you'd be doing oh, yeah. <laughs> ongoing training because obviously – You've got to invest in your people mm. if you are doing that. But mm. I think sometimes people don't see the 
They don't see the value because it's in the air, so to speak. It's not like it ticks a dollar there or a dollar here or on a box. Yeah, exactly. But when you see the end result, I mean, people, for me, like I know you can feel it within people if they mm. buy into something. Mm. And if you're so passionate, it's, it's this electric energy yeah. and it's a natural thing and it's not forced and that's mm. going to make a lot more conversions oh, yeah. <laughs> quickly. What would be your best advice on running a successful sales team? Um, so my best advice would be phone sales, although I do love it, it is a difficult job. Yeah. Um, you know, you have to come in uh, motivated, you, you, you get, you get um, rejection, you get a lot of things. So my best advice would be understand that the, the job that people are doing for your business can be quite difficult yes. and really create an environment that gives them a lot of pleasure to be there because it can mm. be tough. So you've got to incentivize people, you've got to keep it fun. You've got to um, do the trainings. You, you know, you've got to really nurture your team so mm. that they can perform the best because it can be quite tough. Yeah, I really like that. <laughs> Thank you. Very nurturing by the sound. Of it. You understand the process and what mm. it does for people because obviously you've been in those experiences when you mm. started out. So then, smart enough to know and feel what really works, and then be able to create that and probably amplified, <laughs> you know, in the environments that you've created for other people. Mm. Thanks. <laughs> So you've built businesses, you've mm -hmm. sold businesses. Mm -hmm. When do you know the right time to sell? Well, no, it is an interesting question and it really comes down to what your plans are in the future. Mm. So I think sometimes people don't realise, although it may feel uh, like their work is, is difficult and stressful and stuff, but once that's gone, it may feel like they've, that's who they were, you know. So although mm. it may be attractive to accept an offer and a sale of a business, you do have to think about more than just the financial gain or but also how much of a part of your life is it mm. and will you miss it? Um, because I think it can be people don't realize sometimes how much their work is their is their life. Yes. But at the same time, that might be the reason that you want to move on. Yes. You know, so if you if you feel like your life you could picture yourself not doing what you're doing yeah. um, and you picture yourself maybe even doing something else that you've got in mind. Mm. And I think at that point it may be a good time to sell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever thought, oh, damn, I should have held in a bit longer? Well, it is funny. I've definitely looked back, um, particularly in a business that I was in in lead generation where times have changed significantly mm. um, with the way that things are done. And I do feel I wish I was still in that industry in a way because it has innovated a lot um, yeah. since then. But you also can't live with any regrets. Well, you can't go backwards. No, <laughs> Excuse me, I want my business back. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit different, you know, to borrowing a pencil. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So going from lead generation into hospitality, <laughs> big jump. What led you into the hospitality arena? Yeah, so it is definitely a big jump and it's definitely probably, it's not something that I actually envisioned myself um, in. Yep. But my brother... Charlie Carrington, his name is, is quite a well-known chef. Yes, um, I've heard. Youngest a, to get a hat. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so at the time, um, he was looking for a business partner mm -hmm. uh, and the timing worked and that I supported him as well as someone else, um, my, other, my other partner at the, at the time. And we created Atlas Dining, which has yep. become a um, really successful restaurant in Melbourne. Yes. Uh, and I was mostly a silent partner for the majority of it uh, until COVID came. Mm. And in March 2020, we were forced to shut. Um, but in some ways, we're also forced to innovate. Yep. And we created, um, a, it's called Atlas Masterclass. It's actually just about to be renamed Atlas Weekly, which is Atlas an ex Weekly. exciting new branding um, opportunity that we have. And that is, we started off as a, uh, basically a um, like a recipe box yes. um, for people during COVID. So we create three recipes and send them to their homes. Oh. Um, and it was very luckily successful at the time. Yep. And it's now grown to be a yeah, meal kit delivery company that we deliver in three states. That's and fantastic. Yeah. So And so I guess it went from the hospitality and now that is really my main focus. Is so you've, that you work through the online section of building that out. Exactly, yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I think that's so great that you see, okay, yes, everything was put to a halt with COVID and everyone was just sort of going, oh, what do I do with myself? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Melbourne probably was hit the hardest oh, in, in Australia. Mm. But to be able to think on your feet mm. because you've obviously had successful businesses and you've had to innovate or change and 
grow and how you do things that you automatically just saw this as, okay, great, here's an opportunity to maybe put our meals into the hands of some people that mm. might not necessarily be able to ever get to Melbourne restaurant and enjoy mm. that. Mm. Yeah, that's oh. <laughs> I really, I think it's, I think it's fantastic, and I think that's where, when you look at entrepreneurs, for me, mm. that level of innovation, mm. where you, here's a, here's a roadblock, and you're just like, oh cool, how do I jump it? Yeah. Rather than go, ah, oh, you know, and you know, retreat into a cave. It's like, oh okay, this is the situation we have. How do I get there? And I think that's really an admirable quality that you can't teach. Mm. <laughs> I really don't think that that's teachable. I think it comes from that natural inner drive in people. Oh, thank you. But it is interesting now in retrospect, obviously everything's easy to look at in retrospect, but yeah. COVID in some ways for many industries was a massive opportunity mm. um, because it, it did change the way that we lived in so many ways. And, yeah. and obviously in some in industries it was, you know, it was a very difficult time and, and it still was, but... There are also a lot of what they call COVID babies. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we've heard that term, businesses that were born out of that um, time. Yep. Yeah, and it's fascinating to think that, you know, such a change in life can come, but then also some good things can come out of it. So yeah. Definitely a lesson for me to always keep that in mind. I think if, you know, if there is ever adversity or something that there is pot potentially a silver lining and that you can try and search for it. Yeah. I think that the words couldn't be truer in my mind is this, how do you choose to see something in that moment? Yeah. And do you look for that silver lining mm. or do you not? And, you know, and that I think comes down to sometimes fear for people, mm. like the knowns taken away. Oh, definitely. But then for some people who don't like routine and it's like, oh, well, what else can we do? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, but, you know, and that's the fun factor. Mm. You know? <laughs> well, as I think you said earlier, you know, there was a thrill in hitting those sales mm. and I think there's also a thrill in finding those opportunities. Mm. And oh, definitely. I must say when we started the online business, it was extremely thrilling yeah. um, because it was something we hadn't had experience in um, yeah. and it, it, it was amazing to see the uptake so quickly mm. like within the first day or two because it was yeah. that such a funny time. It was COVID and people were looking for things to do yeah. um, that they could get to their homes and everything. So, no, it was a, it was an exciting time definitely. Yeah, yeah. amazing. So what, what's the future looking like for you? Um, so the future for us is we want to become a known as like Australia's established meal kit company. Right. So we are working really tirelessly on creating a subscription plan for people that they can live their lives by. So Brilliant. don't go to the supermarket anymore, eat amazing food um, within, a, within a really good budget. Um, and share those times with your family and friends. Sign me up. <laughs> yes. I hate cooking for one. I hate it. Yeah. yeah. If someone said, what did you have for dinner? I'm like, popcorn. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was so exciting. I put popcorn. I haven't done this for, since I was a kid. And I usually put it on this time. I'm like, I made something. And my friends are like, babe, that's not cooking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if I could just heat something up, mm. in my mind, that's healthy, efficient, you know, because I do long days. Mm. Done. Sign me up. Yeah. Done. I don't have to think. I want diversity in my meals. Mm. But apart from that, if I don't have to think about it, I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Send me the email. Exactly. Oh, add, add me to your EDM <laughs> <laughs> or your CRM. All right, Ben, we're just going to do some quick fire questions. Okay. So these are the fun let's ones. Yeah. Are you ready? Yes, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Three words to describe yourself. Okay, so I would say outgoing. Yeah. Conservative. <laughs> mm, Jekyll uh, uh, Hyde, which uh, one? <laughs> and compassionate. Oh. Well, you wouldn't be good at sales if you weren't, you know. I think, you know, when you look at people and what they do, it sums you up and, you know, puts it into perspective. <laughs> Where you excel. Best business advice you've ever been given and by whom? Um, so it is probably a little bit of a... Everyone's probably heard it a, a number of times, and it is. It, I know it's not always possible for people to to do, um, but my old boss previously um, told me to do what you love, and I know we hear it a lot, and mm. it is it's sometimes easier said than done. Yeah. But I think in time, if you can love what you do, yeah, then it is a great way for success. Yeah, I think you can never hear enough of that. Yeah. I think it's great. Favorite quote or mantra. Okay, so Anthony Robbins, I think yes. he's quite a quite a famous speaker. There's something that he he's said. He's quite famous. That, yeah, he's well known. Yeah. <laughs> something that he said that I, I just saw just recently, which is quite interesting, and it's don't um, people underestimate 
what they or overestimate what they can do in the short term and underestimate what they can do in the long term. So mm. I think that's a very interesting one because I'm definitely guilty of myself wanting to do things quickly. But if you actually think about how can I get there in a 10-year period, then you can achieve a lot more than if you put the pressure on to get there in a one or two. Yeah. Um, so it's something quite interesting I found. I like that. <laughs> Your number one business book. Uh, so it's not necessarily about business, but it is about like kind of wealth creation and understanding money and it would be Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm. Yeah, very well written book, uh, very interesting concepts. And I think it's definitely a must read. Awesome. Yeah. Who inspires you? Um, well, probably at the moment um, I've got local inspirations, but if I was to pick the, the number one, I think at the moment it is Elon Musk. Mm. Um, I think he, what he's doing is just, you know, it's, it's almost non-human, the way that he's, he's in, innovating so many different industries. And although something not to aspire to of, of someone of that level, um, it's definitely incredible to watch someone achieve such Know, greatness in our in our lifetime what's your favorite dish at atlas so the concept of atlas actually is quite unique so my brother travels to a different country every four months and then comes back and does a set menu based on those travels so we change cuisine so we're in our 13th cuisine change at the moment so my favorite cuisine that we have done in the past would be believe it or not one was australian because he did such a class, that's such a unique take, twist on Australian. Yep. And the other one would be Mexican. Mm. If you could give your younger self a piece of advice, <laughs> what would it be? Um, that's an interesting question, but it would probably be to, like I said with that uh, Tony Robbins quote, is to think about time as in long time. So mm. what can you do in, an, in your 20s in that 10-year period, not what can a, you achieve by 21, 22, 23. So think about more as a long term and then what it's going to take to get there. I like that. I was going to ask you what's something you'd like to achieve in the next year, but I'm going to change that. <laughs> what would you like to achieve in the next 10 years? <laughs> well, do you know what's funny? I probably need to have a think about that myself, actually, because I'm still guilty of one year, so I can answer that question. Oh, go for it then. <laughs> uh, no, in one year, I'd like to see our Atlas Weekly um, business expand into Queensland mm. um, so we can be Victoria, New South Wales or Queensland and to establish a strong subscription customer base um, yep. to build. And in 10 years, it's something I need to sit down and take my own advice. I think especially after the last two years, mm. what we've had in place and mm. now we feel the comfort of everything opening back up and staying open, mm. I think it is probably the time where people will sit down and reassess. If you were to study something in the future, what would you like to learn? Well, I think I would go back and study marketing. So mm. I haven't actually studied marketing. Yep. Um, I actually did a Bachelor of Business um, and I momentarily did part of an MBA mm. but I've never actually studied marketing and I think that it is so crucial in all kinds of businesses and it is ever-changing mm. so that would be something that I would like to learn more of. Amazing yeah. well thank you for joining me Ben. <laughs> yeah, oh, thank you very much Mel. <laughs> Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Learning Without Limits interview series. I'm Melanie Burnicle. catch you next time. <laughs>